Welcome, welcome to the Josh Hall Web Design Show. Web Design Show, helping you build better websites and create a web design business that gives you freedom and a lifestyle you love. Hello, friends. Welcome into the podcast. This is episode 192. In this one, I'm excited to dive into a topic that is very near and dear to my heart because we're going to talk about making room in your business for the unexpected. Now, for those of you who may not know, my when my first daughter was born, uh, we spent 56 days in the NICU, the newborn intensive care unit. And needless to say, we were not we were not expecting that. And I learned a lot about my business, the goods and the bads, and I learned about the importance of making sure that you have some safeguards in place so that when life happens, whether in my case, we were you know in the NICU for two months straight, or in some cases, if you just miss a week or a couple weeks, if you, you know, if you break your arm and you can't type for a couple weeks, you need to make sure your business can still survive because any seasoned business owner will tell you, you need to prepare for some sort of unexpected surprise. And that's exactly what we're going to talk through in this episode. And I'm really excited to bring in uh, a business operations consultant. She's also known as the Dubsado Queen. This is Charlotte Isaac, who is, as you'll find, so thoroughly knowledgeable about how to create systems in your business so that you can handle these type of unexpected surprises that are going to happen. Life just happens. Again, I hope for you, it's not something that we went through, which was like a two month ordeal. Um, No, I still worked in that time period, but it definitely threw me for a loop and our finances, you know, we, we made it through, but I basically since then have made strides in my business to make sure if we ever went through something like that again, we would be okay. And I want the same for you. This is really important, especially if you're early on. My gosh, I wish I would have heard this conversation when I was early on in my business because you know, I don't want to be a doomsday, pessimistic type of person, but the reality is you'd have to plan and prepare for unexpected surprises. So I think what you're going to learn from Charlotte in this episode and hopefully some of my experience will help you make some systems in your business so that way, even if you want to take some time off, whether it's intentional or unintentional, your business can still thrive, not even just survive, without you working you know, eight, nine hours a day. So I'm really excited to hear what you think about uh, in this episode and how it helps you and your business. And by the way, when I say, uh, if I want to hear from you, there's a couple different ways you can do that. If you want to leave feedback for me on an episode, you can go to the website post for this episode. You can go to my website at joshhall.co slash 192 in this case, and you can leave a comment on the episode post there, or uh, I'm really active on Instagram now. If you didn't know, I recently fired up my Instagram, so you can go to joshhall.co slash Instagram if you want to hit me up over there and send me a DM and let me know what you think of the podcast. I love to hear how this one helps you out. And again, I think you're really going to learn a lot from Charlotte, who was awesome. And again, I really enjoyed picking her brain on this topic. And I will say before we dive in, one thing, the one thing that got us through the NICU was the recurring income that I had fortunately already built up to that point with my maintenance plan, my website maintenance plan. If you do not have recurring income with a website maintenance plan set up yet, it's not too late. You can get that going immediately. And I can't encourage it enough. It is literally how we got through our two month NICU experience. So I've packed everything I've learned in building maintenance plans and building that solid recurring income for your business. My course for that is open right now. It's my entire website maintenance plan course. There'll be a link at joshhall.co slash 192 for that. If you are ready to build that recurring income, that's going to help you maintain your business through unexpected surprises. That's your course. That's how to build recurring income. And without further ado, here is Charlotte. We're going to have some fun talking about how to make some room in your business for the unexpected. Gosh, it's a good one. So get ready. Let's have some fun. Here we go. Charlotte, welcome onto the show. Thank you so, so much for waking up very early down under to join us here. Thank you, Josh. I'm excited to chat. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, is it six 30 for you or seven 30 for you? Is that right? Six 30. Oh my gosh. This whole it's six 30. Savings thing. I forgot the hour just changed. Yeah. I was thinking it was seven 30 for you and it's three 30 for me right now. So I, I just, let's start off and say, I feel terrible for making you get up so early, but thank you. This is the tricky thing with calls on the other side of the world, isn't it? 
It is. And you know what's extra trippy? I'm on Wednesday, you're on Tuesday. It's just, I don't know. I don't try and do time zone math. So I just turn up and I'm excited to talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm really excited to, to take some time and chat with you here. I love what you're up to. I love your brand. I actually think it'd be a great place to start is uh, first off where you're based out of. I'm sure people are a little curious exactly where you are in Australia. Uh, so let's start there. And then I would love to know when somebody who doesn't know you asks what you do, I'm sure that's a kind of a hard question to answer. What do you tell them? Yeah, so I'm in Sydney, Australia. Um, and it's tricky, that one. I'm sure like most of your listeners probably do something that they try and explain to their parents or their grandma. And they're like, you do what? Like, I don't really understand this thing. So what I do in semi-simple terms is I help small business owners streamline their client processes and automate them with a tool called Dubsado. Yeah. And I, it was funny because when, uh, when your name came through initially, I think I saw that you are kind of known as the, is it the queen of Dub Sato or the, is that your, is that your <laughs> yeah, official title? Is. Look, I feel very awkward calling myself that my students do call me that I'm very flattered. Um, <laughs> embrace it, embrace that title. It's funny for years, I've been known as the Yoda of Divi. So Divi is the, the WordPress theme that I use. And somebody just called me that in my Facebook group years ago. And it just stuck. I became the Yoda of Divi. So for years I had that in my email signature and yeah, it just stuck. It actually really helped me grow my brand. So by gosh, if, if it works, you know, I, I say use it. Cause it's definitely, uh, especially when you think about like a tool, when you think about organization systems, Dubsado, boom, you think of Charlotte. So it's kind of cool. It is kind of cool. You got to roll with it sometimes, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely got to roll with it. And it is interesting. Like you said, when your mom or your grandma asks you what you do, we were chatting before we pressed record here, this whole world of like webpreneur and those of us who do a bunch of different things, it's really interesting because it's kind of, it's awesome. And it's made this like freely jumbled mess of whatever you want to do, but it is really hard to explain. And I think that actually filters into how we sell because if we do too much, it can be really difficult to, to put ourselves out there. Have you found that as well with what you do? Yeah, definitely. For sure. I think when I zeroed in on Dubsado and I just were like, you know what, people are kind of calling me this person. I'm just going to lean into it. And like, that's all I'm going to do. Um, it, it's really, really helpful. The more and more people can just get some crystal clarity on what you do. And that is the challenge of offering lots of different things. And I think it's helpful to do that, particularly at the start of your business, when you're trying to figure out what you like, what you're good at. Um, but zeroing in, I think is a great thing. Yeah. I've learned that over time too. And that's what I'm telling all of my students now is like, try a bunch of different things, particularly in web design. There's so many different things you could, you could dip your toe into, but as soon as you realize what you're good at and what you like, focus in on that and hire out the rest or partner, uh, partner, somebody to, to handle the rest. Cause it does make it a lot easier. Now I'm curious, like, what would you say? What, what's your, what's your email tagline? Like, are you a systems consultant? What is the, what is the succinct way to say like what you do? Oh, that's a hard one, Josh. <laughs> Hitting me with the yeah. hardball straight away. Uh, so <laughs> business operations consultant is is kind of what I say. Um, Dubsado finally released a certification program last year. So now I can say oh. I'm a certified Dubsado specialist, which makes it a little bit easier. Um, it is probably something people need a bit more of an explanation on to get yeah. though. So business, what was it? Business systems, business consultant? operations, consultant operations so systems consultant. are a big part of what I do, but it really dives into the operations. I think when you get deep into systems, it's more about how you do things. Um, that's important, not necessarily what system to use. Mm, well, I was going to ask you that as we were talking about this, what's the difference between systems and operations? Cause that really ties into this idea that we're going to talk about, which is to be able to, to keep some room open in our business for the unexpected. But yeah, what, what's the difference in your mind between operations and systems? I think operations is a really big picture thing. I think it, it's everything to do with how you do things, what your boundaries are like, how your business is set up, um, who's on your team, really how you make things work. A system is a tool that falls underneath that. Um, so if we use Dubsado as an example, Dubsado is something that can make your client operations a lot easier, um, but it's definitely not the big picture. We all need other stuff as well, probably. Yeah, that's true. I, I found that same... Um, that same difficult spot where you're known for a tool, but you realize what I'm doing is a lot more than just this tool. I found that as a web design coach with Divi, like that's kind of a smaller part of what I teach now. I'm so much more focused on 
overarching systems and operations, like you're talking about strategy sales and Divi is a part of it. Uh, have you found that as well with Dubsado just Absolutely. being a tool? Yeah. yeah, definitely. It's an interesting one, isn't it? You work so hard to be known for something and then eventually you kind of like, but we do it a little bit differently here. It's, it's more than just that tool. So I totally get what you mean. It's the same so thing, I think. When your grandma asks you, Charlotte, what do you do again? Now you can say, I'm a business consultant systems organization, Dubsado coach trainer. There it is. Easy peasy. I'm glad we got that <laughs> sorted right on. I'm going to send her this show. She's going to love it. <laughs> there you go. Um, so tell us about an experience. I don't know too much about this. So I just want to put the kind of ball in your court. Um, as far as making room in our business for the unexpected, which is web designers is very common with hacks and client problems, site problems, all kinds of stuff. But then there's just business stuff in the landscape of the economy changing. Of course, we're coming out of two wild years with the pandemic. Um, Tell us about that situation that you went through at the beginning of COVID. What were you doing and what happened that really made you think about this topic and this idea, you know, firsthand? So weirdly, it was two years ago today. I know this because my real estate agent sent me a text yesterday. <laughs> uh, so two years ago today, my husband and I moved into our brand new home and that was really exciting. It's the first time we bought a house together and a couple of days in, we had a water leak and our floors were completely trashed, which is a super lovely way to oh, enter the world no. of having a mortgage. <laughs> Yeah, super enjoyable. <laughs> so have, have you seen had, the have you seen the movie The Money Pit with Tom no, Hanks? No, do I want to? Is it going to make it me cry? It sounds like that. They basically buy a new house that's just completely wrecked and it's just the whole story of it unraveling. So it's it's what made me think about your situation so far. <laughs> I might need to give it another couple of years, but I'll give it a watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as you do, and I know you're doing a bit of a reno at the moment as well, Josh, but when something goes wrong, you're kind of like, oh, well, I'll use this as a chance to do some electrical work as well too. And like we wired up our office and did some repainting and all that kind of stuff. We had to move out again. So we just moved everything in. We had to move everything out. Super fun. Love moving. Um, I was driving back and forward a lot. I got a flat tire, my spare tire apparently was, I don't know, I hadn't used it ever in the whole time of having my car. So it just, something was wrong with it. I can't remember. I probably blocked that one out. Um, had to find a guy to come and bring me a new tire and fit it. And it was just this whole like nightmare week. I can now look back at it and laugh, but I definitely was not laughing at the time. Um, so I think those are the weeks. I mean, I, I think of that when I think about building a business that works no matter what is thrown at you. So the cool thing about having your systems and operations working hard for you is that um, if you have a week like that that's thrown at you, your business can keep going and, you know, you don't have to have that nightmare situation. I know you have two kids, Josh, kids get sick, daycare germs, school germs, all that kind of stuff. Like you said, hacks, like so many things can be thrown at us as business owners. And I think it's really important that we know our business can survive those weeks. It's a great point. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's hours, sometimes it's days, sometimes it's weeks and sometimes it's months. I don't know if you know this, Charlotte, but did you know that my first daughter was in the NICU, the newborn mm -hmm. intensive care unit for two years or two months? Um, yeah. that was a few years ago. So that was like, that was my first case example of like, I was not prepared for that. Luckily, Wi-Fi was good at the hospital and there was a coffee shop around the street and I had just started scaling my business. So I was able to get projects done. Um, but it was extremely trying and that definitely made me reposition and refocus my business now to make sure God forbid something like that does happen. I'm, you know, at least set up for a couple months, this situation that you went through with the house stuff going wrong with your flat tire, all these things, it sounds like when it rains, it pours, of course. So it like all happened at one time. Was your business pretty well set up or was this like the turning point for you to realize that you had to really work on this to make sure your business was set up for that? Yeah, I think I had my systems set up really well. So definitely a lot of it was taken care of. Probably after that, I started to allocate some extra responsibilities to my team. So in mm. some ways, it was a bit of a turning point for sure. Um, it is definitely the sticking point in my mind whenever I make a decision now. I'm like, okay, what would happen if something like this happened again? And I do not expect to have to replace my flooring again. But like you said, we don't know what's going to be thrown at us. You know, same thing with your daughter. God forbid anything else would happen again you know, as a business right. owner, we have to be prepared for it. Yeah. Cause I found that with this idea of like having a business that can work around life, um, 
there's like the plan and expected delays or things like vacations or for, uh, we actually, we're pregnant now with number three. So I know, thank you. Thank you. Leading up to October this year in 2022, I know baby number three is going to come around there. So let's block off the few weeks before the few weeks after not completely, but just arrange my schedule and content to fit that. Um, same thing with, like you mentioned, we're actually, we're actually building a home right now. Same thing. So I know when our move is set, I know the week before, the week of, and the week after, that's the plan. But it's this unexpected stuff that can really derail us. Um, I, as a web designer, always kept time every day for what I like to call reactionary work for a little site widget that would go down or a client need that needed something ASAP. Or if a website went down, that was a different ballgame. But there was at least some reactionary time. Is that something you recommend and you've seen beneficial, whether it be day by day or week by week? Do you, do you recommend setting like certain blocks of time every week? What is the, the practicalities of, of this look like that you've seen work? I love that you have that set aside every day and called it reactionary time. It makes so much sense. I think that, you know, it's going to be a little bit different for everyone. And you, you knew pretty clearly that that was something that was going to pop up in your business with, you know, which is breaking and things like that. Um, I think the important thing, however you deal with it is that you probably only sell half of your time for clients. So I think that often we expect, you know, I work nine to five Monday to Friday, for example, and you think, okay, that's how much time I have to serve my clients. But I think, if you, you know, really think about it, you probably only have maybe two days a week to work on projects. The extra three days can be flex time. They can be time to work on your business. They can be time to work on, you know, those reactionary issues that pop up. So however you carve aside time for it, I think it's really, really important. Best case, you get extra time with your family, you know, walk your dogs, do whatever you do with your free time and happy days. No one's ever going to complain about that, but we want to make sure there's, there's extra time baked into the day or the week so that when these things happen, it doesn't mean you finish late. That's a great point. When it comes to billing out for our time, whether we do hourly or fixed projects, it's such a great reminder that we are literally only generally billing out for actual work hours unless we uh, accommodate for all the other stuff like calls, admin work. And of course, like you mentioned, there's a big difference between working in the business and doing the web design and the work versus working on the business, like systems, processes, all the things that you help out with. So that is a really, really important reminder. I love that you said that because with the idea of like this, these unexpected things that could happen, whether they're big or whether they're small, that all needs to be factored in. How do you, I actually want to take us to goal setting. Um, do you factor in, of course, I wasn't able to anticipate that we were going to spend 56 days in the NICU, but I am kind of factoring in now like days that aren't going to be planned or weeks that aren't going to be planned. How do you factor that in with goals? Like if you have a monetary goal, do you just assume, you know, for a few days or a few weeks of that year that aren't going to go as planned? Have you had any or seen any good strategies that have helped with that? Yeah, definitely. I'm trying to cast my mind back to a little spreadsheet I made for my students a few months ago, and I'm trying to remember exactly what went in there. Um, but in a very basic sense, if we think about, you know, there's 52 weeks in a year and you know that you want to make, let's say you want to have a six figure year, whatever the number is, that's your financial goal. Then I think we can start to take things out of that. So maybe you want to allow four weeks annual leave during the year and a couple extra weeks off at Christmas. Maybe you know that things are going to go wrong and, you know, sick kids or like family unexpectedly coming into town. So maybe you add like take off an extra couple of weeks for that. Um, think about your office hours. So I don't work Mondays. So I need to like mm. carve off four days a week for that. Sorry, one day a week off for that. Um, and then you kind of end up with a pool of hours or days that is really your billable time. And that's how we can get an hourly rate that makes sure that the, you know, the billable time we're spending can actually also help our business thrive over the seasons where we're not working as much because you yes. want to pay yourself like whether you're working or not. That's so true. Yeah. And like the corporate world, you work a job, you get two weeks paid vacation. And then suddenly when you're a freelancer or you're in the wild west of entrepreneurship, you realize, shoot, 
I need to make sure all my projects are compensating for holidays and time off and vacations because I'm not getting paid unless I have a recurring type of subscription set up. Um, what a perfect segue, Charlotte, to a recent episode I did, which was 172 on how to figure out your hourly rate. And I talked about this same thing. Basically, my formula for figuring out an hourly rate to accommodate for this stuff is to take the amount of money, like first off, what you want to make ideally in a year, divide that by 12, 12 months, take that number, divide it by four, four weeks in a month on average, then divide that by five, five days, and then divide that by however many hours you work. But there's a big caveat in that episode, uh, just teaser for everyone who's going to go back and listen to that. You do have to accommodate for the weeks and the days you're not going to work, which is just what you said. So um, I don't know if there's like an exact percentage on this, but I've always found like, if you figure that your rate is going to be 75 an hour based off of how many days you want to work, how many hours you're generally going to raise that by 20 to 25% to account for everything else. Is that kind of a fair assessment or do you recommend more ideally? What are your thoughts on that? Look at my head went straight to double it, which might be a little, mm. a little bit extreme for sure. I think that the more fat we build into these things, the better. And I'm not saying go and price gouge your clients. Um, I just think more most of us wildly underestimate how much extra time um, it takes to look after clients. I'm, I have a web designer client that went through one of my programs recently um, and we kind of did some of this maths with her and, you know, all the extra meetings, all the extra emails she was dealing with. Um, it adds up so quickly. And I think we are very quick to dismiss that unless we really sit down with a pen and paper. So I think if you add 20 or 30% great, if you feel like you can add maybe a little bit more as a bigger buffer, then you're never going to hate yourself for that. That's a good point. And with that idea of like the time sucking little emails and tasks and calls, that is a killer for web designers. And the reason I learned to implement a reactionary work segment is because that's that was the problem. I found myself every day basically being a 24-7 support person to my clients. It wasn't an issue early on for me, but it became an issue when my business grew and I had a lot of different clients. So for web designers in particular, the idea of like controlling the lines of communications and really setting yourself up for success is monumental. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you have any other tips for constraints and making sure that you actually run your day and that your day doesn't run you? Because that's what we all end up fighting as an entrepreneur, right? Definitely. I think boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. I know you did an episode on this recently as well too, yeah. but I think we, again, underestimate the importance of boundaries. It's so easy to let your clients run your day. Um, and it changes everything when you're like, okay, no, I'm in control of this. So if we're talking about reactionary stuff with clients, I think giving them a really clear idea on how best to contact us. So with my clients, you may not be able to do this with web design. Cause I think there are things that can go wrong a little bit easier, but with my clients, I used to say to them, it's actually best if you book a time to talk with me. So mm -hmm. don't email me. Here's a link. You can get on my calendar. You'll get the first available spot, but then we've got half an hour set aside dedicated to go through your problem. I prefer that because I find emails quite overwhelming. Um, but maybe it's like email this email. These are the kinds of things you should contact me for versus these are the kinds of things you should contact somebody else for. Um, and I'll get back to you within two days. I think the clearer we can be, the better. Yeah, that you just said, the clearer you can be, the better, because clients are just going to text you or do it. They're going to communicate with you however they normally do it. So you need to tell them exactly how and when. And you're right, for web designers, it can be tricky depending on the situation. But I've always taught and I've always experienced myself to let clients know if it is urgent, this is the path. But if it's just like you want to add a staff member within a couple of weeks, then, you know, send it here kind of thing. And often you can just get all those messages and just funnel them or have a VA funnel all your messages to the right, you know, folder that you are going to act on or your team will act on. So, um, but that is really important with this idea of making time for the unexpected because it is going to happen. And I, I would love to know your thoughts on this because you don't want to be a pessimist, but you do have to just plan for buying a new house and your floor flooding or, you know, God forbid you break your, your, your wrist for and you're out for two months. Like you do have to expect that something is going to happen. Um, have you experienced that? Obviously you have, but what about your students? Do you kind of preach that same message as well? Like expect the unexpected. I don't know a better way to say it. 
Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes I feel like my job is being the pessimist and you probably have this a little bit with your students, you know, you're talking to them best about how to plan their hourly rates to protect themselves and how to work. I know you've got um, a lot of great stuff around maintenance and, and kind of how to approach that with clients. It's the same thing. I think our job you've done your research on me. You, you've done your oh, research on me. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a web designer wannabe. I'm not really. <laughs> Stick with Dubsado, I would say. <laughs> why why you've respect. got the title. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, definitely. Um, but I think that it's our job sometimes as educators and it's our job as um, as service providers too to educate our clients on what might go wrong, the kinds of things to look out for and what to do when they are. And I think it's kind of the same as, as when you go to a doctor. This is a weird analogy, but if they tell you, hey, there's a chance that something might go wrong, we're all on top of it. Um, like don't stress if that happens versus if something happens and you're not sure about it, um, you're going to panic straight away. But if we knew that there was a chance that something could go wrong and like, you're like, okay, cool. Like Josh has got it. Um, Charlotte's got it. It's totally fine. They knew this might happen. So I think both as an educator and as a service provider, it's almost a job to be that person. Yeah, that's that's a good analogy. That's a great analogy in the case, particularly of of a website that's never done. It's it's like health is never done for somebody. A website's never done either. There's going to be constant movement on it. Um, so re reactionary work, time blocking per day, maybe a day a week, maybe a segment. Yeah, let's zoom out on that. Like, what are your thoughts on having a day that's no calls and just maybe is perhaps for this kind of thing or the work that you want to do. Like I always found with my reactionary block, it didn't mean that every day I was playing catch up. It was just, I had that hour. Generally for me, it was between three and 4 PM to just about in the day. I would just make sure nothing was planned on most days for that time period. That way, if something happened, I could get to it. And if there was nothing cool, I could do work or go out, play tennis, whatever. Um, what about that? Like, do you, obviously it sounds like you back up that idea, but do you also recommend going even further with like a day a week or something on a larger scale? It sounds like as web designers having maybe an hour a day might be more effective than a day a week for that kind of reactionary stuff. But I think for working on your business a day a week or something that works for you is really, really great because I don't know how often have you thought you want to do something. And then six months later, you're like, I've had this idea for six months. I just haven't done anything with it. So I love a day called a CEO day where you just, you're like, okay, I don't have to worry about my clients day. This is like my day to make my business better. They are my favorite days. And those are big to put in the calendar, right? Like for me, I learned to make that a project like calendar. Nothing's getting through this. I'm going to a coffee shop or I'm like intentionally doing this. It's not like, oh, if I have the time, I'll work on the business because we all know it's never going to happen if you have that mindset. Absolutely. You will never see that one day unless it's in your calendar, you change your schedule. So you can't take meetings on those days. If you use like a Calendly or Acuity or the scheduler inside Dubsado, like block that off because no one else is going to protect your time. You have to do it for yourself. Gosh, it's so true. And I was just thinking back to my business, the biggest, like the biggest moves I made in my business that quote unquote, move the needle forward. And were like the biggest impact things were all CEO day kind of things. I didn't call it back then. It was just like working on the business. Um, but the reality was me spending a whole day nitpicking code and doing revisions for a client really did not move my business forward at all. What did was, for example, when I created a workflow in my billing system, which I always use 17 hats. I'm sorry. I know you're a Dubsado gal, okay. but I use oh, 17 ads <laughs> and uh, I set up a workflow to automate all my proposals, questionnaire, contract, invoicing all together. And yeah, it took some time, but I'll tell you what, the, when the first few clients came on board after that, I realized how much time I saved and all that automation that helped me grow my business was stemming from that one CO day. I mean, I think it probably only took me five or six hours total to get all that set up, but it made five or six times, no, well, may, way more than that of an impact on my business just by clearing out that time that was intentional. Um, so yeah, that's my practical example of how important it is to have that CEO day that's uninterrupted or even what about a CEO segment? Do you like that idea or do you like ideally given like a full day of attention to something? I kind of like 
like the full day because I think that it gives you a bit more space for your mind to wander and like really step out of the zone of worrying about your clients. I, I personally find that if I only had a few hours, I'm probably, my mind's still probably going to be somewhere else a little bit. So mm. giving it a whole day and I can kind of make it a fun day, like get up, go have coffee, walk the dogs, get some fresh air. You mentioned like going and working in a cafe or something like that. Um, I think it just gives you a little bit more breathing room to think as well as just do. I agree. I'm actually thinking back to a lot of the projects that I've done over the past couple of years and the ones that I gave full attention to like a full day did, they actually have stuck to me the most. Like I remember I went through a course by Pat Flynn before I started my podcast here to learn about podcasting. And I did two days straight. I did clear some time for emails just to make sure I'm not missing anything, but it was basically two full days. And I remember those days. Most of my work days are a blur, but I remember those same thing. When I developed my uh, coaching community, I remember I went to a coffee shop and I cleared like six hours, a full day just to that and just learn and implement it and tinker it. And, and it really was, it, again, kind of just stuck to me in my memory and, and it helped me get so much further rather than spending half an hour here, half an hour there. And like you said, inevitably your mind tends to kind of get wrapped up in other things because it really goes back to multitasking. What's your thought on multitasking? I, I have my thoughts on it, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I don't believe it's possible. <laughs> I just, good. I really don't. I think that you can't ever do something properly if you're multitasking. And I think we would all love to think we can do it, but I don't think we really can. What do you think? I would agree. I think it's horseshit. Yeah. That <laughs> yours was a much more eloquent way to say it. Uh, I agree. Yeah. I, and I've just learned that from experience. It, it honestly goes back to what I just said with just almost just remembering, like being present in the moment. Cause if you're not present, inevitably you only have a hundred percent to give. You're either going to give 50% here and 25 here and 25 here, or if you go over, you're burning out. Um, yeah, I think there's a massive issue with people doing too many things. There are some people right now watching this interview and designing websites. I think that's a little bit different when, cause like, that's how I consume podcasts. I'm always doing something else. Um, but I have learned that certain work is catered to that. Like I don't listen to podcasts or watch shows. If I am, um, writing stuff, I, my brain does not do well with both, but if I'm designing, I'm good because it, it seems to act, it seems to access a different part of the brain. So that's the only time I'm cool with multitasking is, is if it's something that, um, can benefit each other. But in most cases, especially when it's like consuming a course, and I'm guilty of this. I have some courses I'm going through right now that I'm like having to schedule and make sure I go somewhere, phones off, emails off, notifications off. I'm just in the course for like two or three hours and that's it. And it makes a big impact. It really does. Have you ever thought about or looked into doing like a solo retreat in your business? Have no, but that? it's funny you mentioned that. I have a close colleague, Chris, who's the owner of Lifter LMS, and he talks about going on this like four, three or four day sabbatical just by himself. Now he's like, he's a woods guy and he's from like, he did sled dog running in Alaska. So he's a wild man. He just, he belongs in nature with an internet connection at some point. I'm not quite that guy, but the idea of just like getting out and doing that, I'm, I'm definitely intrigued by. Um, now, as a mentor coaching session here, of course, I have a family. I don't want to leave my wife with all the responsibilities for several days. What does that look like? Could, could it be done in like six hours or just a segment? Um, yeah. What yeah. do you think on that? That's an interesting one to play around with, isn't it? Because I think that there, there is a power in making it longer. Like we've talked about the benefit of doing six hours instead of half an hour. Like there's something great about the compounding. I think it's, maybe it's an environmental thing. Maybe it is taking yourself out of your space and going to a cafe or going and working in a park or something like that. Um, probably That's big can for me. Done. Yeah, that that's big for me. That's one reason why I've learned that being in my home office is great for certain work, but like for example, when I outline a course or if I have really high level thinking and planning, I'm in a coffee shop. That's where I tend to, to thrive. And then some of my best ideas and breakthroughs come when I'm on a walk. Like we, uh, we just jumped onto this call. Same. I just was just walking the golden retrievers. And, um, that actually, I was able to think of some questions that I was going to hit you with here. Um, so yeah, some of, you know, I, for me, it was changing the environment that was 
the the biggest thing for me. What about you? Have you found that as well? Or what are, what are the tips and tricks that have helped you? Definitely. I'm an environment person as well too. And, and that's probably been one of my struggles for the last couple of years. I mean, we've gone through, we kind of did like a delayed lockdown here in Australia. We did it in 2021. I think you guys did it more in 2020. Um, but I think that that has really cemented for me the power of getting out, also meeting new people and seeing people. I think that, um, you know, spending more time with people in your community. I know you've got your coaching community and like hearing from other people, it doesn't necessarily have to be in person. Um, it's pulling yourself out of your day to day. I think listening to things, hearing from people, talking to people, um, just being in a different space, either mentally or physically. Yeah, that's a great point. I know it's funny. A lot of my members in, in my coaching community in particular, and a lot of my like monthly student Q and A's, people have said the same thing, but they go into a Q and a often without having a question, but they leave feeling like they just gained so much value and they have more questions about different stuff because their mind was intrigued or peaked or it's like, Oh, you know, such and such is having the same problem that I'm having. I want to know how they got through it. Um, that was, that's been really interesting for me as a coach to do these Q and A's and it's not any, I'm not saying like, I'm an all powerful guru that has all the answers, but it has forced me also to like learn and to hear these challenges and be like, Oh, you know what? This is my experience on this, but maybe somebody else has a better uh, interpretation on this or something that, that definitely, I think anytime you hear somebody else or interact with somebody else, you're always going to walk away with some clarity or new ideas. Right. Is that kind of what, what you've experienced yeah, 100%. with that? I think one of my biggest learnings for business, and we're definitely getting out of the operations world here, but one of the, the biggest things that I found over the last, um, how many years it's been is that community is so like it's just so important, whether it be having a really good friend that knows and understands what you do. They might not be a web designer as well, but they might have a business that's kind of similar, or it might be a community of web designers. I think that having people that you can learn from that, you know, are having some of the same challenges as you and, and are working on it to solve at the same time. I think it's huge. It is huge. And to tie that back in with this idea of, you know, the unexpected, one thing that I found early on in my journey compared to where I am now is right now I have such an amazing close network of web designers and entrepreneurs that I do not feel alone. I did feel alone in my web design journey for a long time. So when those unexpected things did happen, I felt even more alone. And actually come to think of it, I felt most lonely in my journey and ready to quit when I was hit with a website hack or something unexpected or something I just didn't know. And I didn't know where to turn. Um, how I got out of that, I don't really remember. I think I probably jumped in a group or a forum and probably found somebody to, to help with that. Um, I think that's what really articulates the power of community now with this idea of unexpected events. Have you seen that as well? Like if you are empowered with a community, the unexpected is not as scary. Would you back that up? I would. Absolutely. I think it's just nice to know, like you said, someone else has got your back. Maybe they haven't gone through it before, but they've probably got a clear head about it because it's not happening to them so that they can talk you through it a little bit more and help you brainstorm without that. Oh my God, what the hell is happening? Like, how am I right. going to deal with this? I, yeah, I think that's huge. Yeah, it is really important, especially even if it's not something that's unexpected, even if it's like up ahead, which kind of breeds to this unexpected thing. It's like I, I for example, earlier today, we did a, a coaching call in my community and one of my members is he came from a print graphic design world and he's, he's more and more getting into web design. So he's not as confident on the web design side of things quite yet, but he's going to this networking group. It's in two days at the time of recording this. And um, he was saying... I just like, I'm a good web designer. I've got results, but I just feel weird. I don't feel confident sharing about the results I can get people because I just, I'm not sure if I'm at that level. And I told him with clients, first of all, their websites are probably terrible. You at your like weakest are way better than their website. So you will do good for them. And even if you're just 10% ahead of somebody, you can be the guide. You can be the expert for clients in particular. Uh, and I told him like, you don't have to necessarily sell a certain, uh, range of 
conversions or whatever, you just need to have care and say, your goal is to help them grow their business and you're going to do your best to do that. And you will even just with basic stuff. And that just changed the game for him. It made, he even said on this call, he, he felt more comfortable and he felt ready. Just somebody else's interpretation and a little bit of advice and a different perspective, um, particularly with something unexpected or up ahead, which is kind of interesting. I guess something up ahead could be viewed as unexpected too, right? Cause you never know what's yeah. going to happen. Absolutely. None of us know what our business is going to look like in a year as, as much as we do planning. I think some of the things or the avenues I've gone down in my business are the ones that I probably wouldn't have planned out. And they just kind of yeah. happen. Like I never thought I would start my program. I was always like, I'm probably not going to do an online course. I don't know. And then here we are. Suddenly here I do are. have one now. <laughs> now I figured we would talk about this earlier. I can't believe we've been talking for a little while and have it got into this, but everything that's gone in the past two years with, with COVID and stuff, obviously that's like the subtitle of this episode probably is the unexpected worldwide economic changes that have been going on. What's your perspective on that as far as pivoting and adjusting our businesses to those kind of things? Because obviously this is not something that's unique to just you and I, this is for everybody. We've all had to adjust stuff. Um, open-ended question, but what what have you learned, I guess, over the past couple of years with how we can prepare for the unexpected that none of us can control, like, like the pandemic? That's a really good question, isn't it? Um, it's a huge one to think about. I think that there is a time and place for pivoting, for sure. Um, the pandemic made me pull my finger out and finally create my program, EC Society, which had been mm. on my brain for like years. Um but I think as a web designer, I'm not sure I would necessarily recommend pivoting. I think that it's made other people pivot, which has put web designers in a really, really great position. I know like I'm yeah. watching my my students in my community who are web designers and they're working with people that are finally going online um, and, you know, bricks and mortar stores that are kind of like, hang on, like we probably should have been online before this, but like now's really the time. It's forced, so, forced the issue for sure. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And I mean, this must be so common for you to hear. Um, but I think that you can pivot for sure. But I think that there's something about holding fast and like knowing what you're good at and being confident that people will come to you. Yeah. For web designers, you nailed it. The, the opportunity has never been greater, which is aw it's awesome, honestly, for, for, for the web design world, because it's continuing to just boom. Everyone, if they're not online yet or coming online or they realize the importance or, um, just recently I had my colleague on, um, who is a, a Shopify plus partner in the world of e-commerce. And he basically said the the e-commerce world was basically propelled from five to 10 years out till now. So there's so much opportunity, but that does bring a lot of challenges and it does bring um, a lot of different aspects in web entrepreneurship. And um, there's so many tools. It can almost be so overwhelming with so many different options. So I, I think sometimes, like you said, focusing on what you do best will help you combat all the things of the unexpected because you got to know what you do and you got to feel confident with it. And, and that's, that's what I've learned. That's going to help grow businesses for you personally. What, what made you pivot and what made you, I guess not pivot, but what made you finally do that? Did you have extra time on your hands? Was it a need from your, from your, uh, leads and your customers, what made you actually move forward with that program? Honestly, it was fear. Um, so mm. I found in my business, probably similar to web design and it's kind of something people put off. So I know with how I, how I help people. And like, like you said, with building your workflows, it's probably something you'd put off before you'd set aside those, you know, I think you said like four to five hours it took you to do it. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many months you'd been thinking about that before you actually went and did it. I think it was technically over months. It was probably like a year <laughs> and a half or two years at least. Yeah, For exactly. freaking six hours. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? And then the payoff right. for that is just so huge. Like we should all kick ourselves with these things that we do. So yeah. my, my business actually was really lucky in the pandemic. It was really good for me as well too, because a lot of people were like, 
oh my gosh, like this is the perfect time to start to set up some of these things. A lot of my clients are people that work in person, like photographers and things as well. So my clients that weren't able to um, work online started to go, hey, this is a great time. Um, So I probably didn't have to do it, but honestly, it was the fear of like, am I going to be redundant now? Are people not going to want to do this or are they not going to have enough investment to do it one-on-one? So that's kind of what made me start it initially. Um, It was something I I always thought like maybe in the next couple of years I would do. Um, it was just a little bit of fire under my butt. Also, I was in lockdown. Like what else do you do? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, that's true. There was, honestly, I think for me, what I found as a course creator is there were so many people who finally had time to get into mm-hmm. the courses because they were like, I just got laid off. I had some students who cooked through, I have a bundle with all my courses and some of them like went through all the courses in a couple of weeks, which you can do. Um, of course the pandemic helped those people because they, they had the time, but I will say if somebody puts it in their calendar and makes it a priority, you could get through my courses way sooner than dragging it out for days or months or weeks or whatever, uh, just by, you know, making it a priority. So uh, yeah, I, I found that the, the same too. They, but what's interesting is you said there was some fear involved with that. I think there's probably a healthy amount of maybe not fear, but maybe not anticipation either. I'm really having a hard time figuring out what the right I think word it's not of this being like, complacent, maybe. Yeah, maybe that maybe that's it. Just the idea of like the, the vision ahead and the uncertainty, maybe like, what can I do to combat the uncertainty of what I offer? Like for me, the courses for you, the course to do something at scale. So I think there's a healthy version of that too, that we have to balance, right? Because if you didn't have that push and you didn't think like, what if I do become redundant, maybe you wouldn't have created your course and now you're doing stuff at scale and globally. Like, is that kind of a, a mindset that you've found as well, that sometimes the fear, the fear of the unknown can actually be a benefit as long as it doesn't overtake you. (laughs) Yeah. I I think like leaning into your fear is so important. I, um, I still vividly remember my first discovery call. I don't know whether you remember yours when you started your business. Like I was like so nervous. I was like, this can be terrible. I'm going to vomit. Like I'm on zoom. What is this zoom thing? Of course it's before everyone was using (laughs) zoom. And like, I look back now and I love being on calls, like a podcast interview a few years ago would have absolutely terrified me. I'm having so Mm. much fun now. Um, I think that like, we've got to keep stretching ourselves as business owners. Otherwise you'll probably get bored as well. I know for me, like the things that felt hard a couple of years ago are now probably really boring. So leaning into your curiosity and just stretching yourself is a really good thing. Yeah. The the things that are right outside your comfort zone are what's going to move you forward in business that I know there's a more eloquent quote for that, but it's true. I I've learned that with being more comfortable on camera. I've learned that with actually more recently, I'm actually getting more comfortable personally on just asking, just reaching out to people. Um, I've got Amy Porterfield coming on the podcast soon. I don't know if this will come out before or after that, but, um, I just reached out and if I didn't for a couple of weeks. I was like, I, I don't know if the show is big enough for her, but I just decided to screw it. Let's just do it. I sent a little personal video to the team and it made its way through to her and, sh- and she's excited to come on. So like, that's my personal thing I'm, I'm doing right now is just like getting out of my comfort zone and reaching out before that. You're totally right. It was getting on camera. It was, it was going to a networking group my first sales meetings were actually in person. So it was like a double whammy. Um, (laughs) It was like not only on a call, but actually going somewhere and meeting with somebody Um, for kids these days who just, you know, just do what zoom calls and don't even call or meet people. uh, That's, it was, it was kind of the double whammy, but again, those were the biggest strides of my business, getting out of my comfort zone and doing something there. And you're right, Charlotte. I think if anyone finds themselves complacent and you're, you're just, you're either not excited or you're not a little bit scared about doing something, then you should do one of those two things. You you should do something that you're really excited about, or you should do something that you're afraid to do. I think, would you back me up and saying maybe those two things are, are the things yeah. that keep you going and, and keep you moving 100%. forward? percent. And to bring it back to community, surround yourself by people who are going to make you feel like a rock star for doing it. Like mm. I know if I do something terrifying, I have friends who I can message me like, oh my God, I just did this thing. And I'm sure you told someone that you've got Amy Porterfield on the show and you're like, holy crap, did that just happen? Like, yeah, my, my, surround my, my web design celebrate. Yeah. My web design club was the first people I told because my family is going to be like, who's that? But yeah, if no I, big if, deal. 
if I put it in my club, they were like, congrats. I'm so excited. Yeah. I, oh gosh. It's so true. Yeah. To have that like support system that's excited there for you. Key. Yeah. I think what the, the more you do it to, it's a muscle. Like now that you've done this, you're probably going to go do something like even bigger. You're like, cool. Like I could do that. I didn't lose my mind. I wasn't like embarrassed off the face of the earth. Yeah. Josh Hall now disappears. <laughs> so every <laughs> right. time you do it, like you get a little bit better at it. Yeah, that's true. Gosh, on every level. Like I remember the, the first time I went to a networking group, I'm in there shaking. We did a 30 second commercial. I'm like sweating. Uh, by the end of that group, I led the group. I was the president. And it's, it's, it's definitely, I've, I've learned that right outside of the comfort zone. And then that, that place of like fear or excitement, because it, that, those do kind of tend to go hand in hand. Mm. That's where it's at. That's where the best things are at. So I hope this is an encouragement for everyone to, to do that and to, and to keep your business move forward to, to kind of, I feel like every topic we're getting into can tie into this unexpected because the best things happen from the unexpected that I found often. Um, and I've learned that if you keep your business moving forward and you're innovating, it tends to it tends to like, Oh, it tends to compensate for the fear of the unknown or instead of just sitting in paralyzed in fear and like, Oh, I don't know if clients are going to call me. If you're proactive and you just go, it alleviates all that because people will call you and they'll see you visible. Have you seen that as well? Like just the power of progress and just momentum and just freaking do something, move forward. hundred percent. I don't know whether you noticed this um, way back in the agency days, but I find my business would really go in waves. So every time I'd push myself into something, I'd have this giant uptick in my growth. Um, and it just kept happening like that. So I think moment, yeah, momentum is great. It's, it's so powerful and it, it reminds us to keep doing the same thing and more of it. And, you know, absolute worst case, if you don't get more clients from it, then, you know, you've done everything you can, but that's not going to happen if you it's put not going to happen and do the scary things. It's yeah. true. You may have those seasons. We all have those seasons. I still have those seasons. I just came through a, a couple months that were not great. They weren't bad, but they weren't great. I was definitely disappointed with, with kind of where my numbers were at and stuff, but we're recording this in late March, 2022, this past month, I've already seen a dramatic difference just because I kept the momentum going. And I've learned, don't be discouraged. Just keep going, keep your mission right front and center. Keep helping people keep doing what you do. Keep innovating, keep having fun, keep getting out of your comfort zone. And that's what turns things around. Like, for example, I reached out to Amy Porterfield and her team during that period of like the low period. So it was the perfect, I will say, I didn't think about this, but getting notified by her team that she's interested in coming on was a massive uh, mentality shift for me. Cause it went from like, I'm a little discouraged to like, Holy crap, Amy's coming on the podcast that like that just is the sheer fact of reaching out, keeping momentum going. That's what helped me get through a little bit of a just blast season. I don't know whether you find this as well too, but I find that the more confidence I show up with just the better everything else happened. Like the times I've shown up to discovery calls thinking like, I'm excited to work with you, but you should be excited to work with me. Like yeah. they are the people that sign their contract in like 10 minutes of me sending it through and they pay the deposit. And I'm like, sweet. Like, you know, I'm pretty cool here. I There's do something agree. huge about confidence. Confidence and just excitement. I mean, if you're not yeah. super confident about sales or results, if you're excited and you're just really willing to and eager to help, that translates big time, maybe even more than confidence in my mind. And I say that because when I started in web design, I didn't have much confidence at all. But what I did have was care and, and eagerness to help clients out. And that's what got me my first paid clients. So all those things combined, they really come through in calls and sales and yeah, everything. I think it might be energy. I think that's the energy, thing that yeah. puts it up. It can be, it can come from confidence. It comes from care. It can come from excitement for you thinking, holy crap, like this is a really cool client for me. I'm so excited to work with them. Um, yeah. I think the more you show up with energy and excitement about your business, which, which is a big reason why we want to build a business that feels good to us. Um, you know, when you get in that place where you start to resent everything and your clients are hard and, you know, stuff's going wrong and you got hacked last week and you got to do this this week. And I think the more you can get yourself out of that place, the better, because that energy is really what helps build the momentum. That's a, that's a really good point. It's, it's important too, I think for those downtimes and those low periods, which, are going to come 
If they haven't come yet, by golly, they're going to come. Um, they could be really low periods or just semi-low periods like what I just went through. But what I have found is by keeping momentum going, whether it is expected or unexpected, I tend to rebound faster. So it doesn't affect me as much anymore. Like I really don't lose sleep over something. Like I had, I've had a couple master classes, webinars, different things I've done. Some have been pretty good and some just kind of flopped quite honestly. So, but I'm not like, Oh, all that work I did flopped. I'm so depressed. I suck at what I do. Who's going to buy my courses? I'm just like, all right, that didn't work very well. Let's move on here. Maybe, maybe I'm not maybe I need to redo that or redo some things. Let's move on to this. Um, at least that's the mentality that I've learned as a, as a scrappy entrepreneur over the years is if it doesn't work, don't let it discourage you. Just move on, pivot and go or change it up, change it up and go. And that's at least when it comes to this idea of the unexpected highs and lows, that's really what's helped me out is I am not going to stop. I, I am not going to stop the momentum. It's all learning, isn't it? I think that anything yeah. that happens in business, there's a lesson in it if you look hard enough. Yeah. And what we're talking about here is probably really inspirational for some folks, but the reality is unless you act on it, nothing is going to change. Like my hope though, is that somebody who goes through a low period or doesn't get that project they're really excited about and it didn't, they didn't land it, that you're not discouraged for long. Like, okay, look at it. It sucks. Look at what you could have done better, but then pivot and move from that fast, like really quick. And I'm hoping this episode is a reminder. Remember that talk with Josh and Charlotte, they encouraged me to get past this. They went through it too. Everyone goes through it, move forward, just move forward. Keep that progression going. Yeah. I couldn't have said it better. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Charlotte, this has been, we've almost been chatting for an hour. We really covered wow. a lot of really cool things as far as all the things that are in and, in and around this, the unexpected. And I didn't really think about it until chatting with you, but the unexpected of the future can be just as scary as the unexpected of the, the now, right? Like we don't know. I don't know what web design is going to look like in 10 years. Who knows? Who knows what the, the the next five to 10 years will look like in the organizational world or the Dubstar world? How do you manage? Um, I guess we've kind of already talked about this, but how do you intentionally manage the un the um the uncertainty of the future? Because that could that could paralyze you, but obviously you're staying innovative and inactive with it. Yeah, how do you how do you combat that? I think it's remembering why you started your business. Um, so for me, I want to help people make their lives better. I want to help people have businesses that feel good and they've got time to spend with their family and friends. And, you know, they they enjoy going to work, so to speak, whether it's your home office or you've got a co-working space or you've got a studio. Like I want people to feel really great about that. So if in 10 years time I'm doing something completely different, but I'm still helping people feel better about their business and, and make their lives easier, then I'm happy as Larry. I don't know whether you say that in the States. <laughs> I say things don't. sometimes I'm like, Ooh. <laughs> that's one of my favorite things about interviewing people across the world though, is there's always a term or something that people don't say here. Uh, I love that. Like you guys say rubbish. And, uh, I know my friends in the UK always say brilliant. And I'm like, I love that. I'm going to start saying brilliant and I'm going to bring that stateside. Um, so happy is Larry. <laughs> I'll definitely start using that too. They're going to be like, Apparently who's Larry? Larry's really happy. I don't know who Larry is. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it should be Henry or something with an H like happy as Henry, but uh, it should we'll be. Figure Maybe it out. I'll bring that to Australia. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. that's, that, that's a good point. So that makes sense though, that your, your mission, that's, it's the driver, right? Yeah, definitely. I don't know whether you have something in, and as a web designer, like ultimately you want to help people have a great website, but it's more than that. Um, I think if we scratch below the surface of what we're trying to help our clients do and, and why we love what we do, I think no matter what changes, there's always going to be a place for it. Yeah, that's a good, that's ooh, what a great snippet there. No matter what changes, there's always going to be a place for the mission of, of what you're doing because yeah, it, regardless of tactics, tools, like you said, this kind of goes back to the first point of you don't want to get too far into a tool, which is maybe why you don't want to be the dub Sado queen. Um, same thing with me. Like a lot of my students now use Elementor and different tools. Some of them not even WordPress, which is I, I've never used anything but WordPress. So um, it's that same thing. You don't want to go too far into a tool if you're in a, in a different way, because no matter what happens, the strategies, the mission, those, those are, those remain the same, but the, the, the tactics might change a little bit. 
Um, yeah, 100%. Yeah, so. And hopefully, you know, I love Dubsado. I'm happy to be the Dubsado queen. But if you are listening and you're using 17 hats or HoneyBook, like this podcast should still be helpful to you. And the principles of building great automations that makes your life easier are still the same. It really doesn't matter which tool you use. And that's the cool thing at looking at the big picture sometimes. Yeah. Great call. Yeah. Well, I wonder if the HoneyBook honey is out there somewhere or the HoneyBook queen. I'm sure there's, there's a, a guru for everything. So You've got um, an alternate career here in naming things, Josh. I don't know. I, we've really discovered, we've discovered that I might need to come up with a name consulting business. My, my girls are already rolling their eyes at me with my dad jokes, but I'm finding that there's definitely a niche for it. So, uh, by golly, I'm going to keep that up. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So, well, this has been great. I have one final question for you. Before we get to that, though, uh, where would you like people to go to connect with you and find more about your services and what you're up to? Yeah. So I have a free mini course called Seven Steps to Automation. If you've been kind of listening to us and you're like, okay, I need to worry about the unexpected, um, getting set up with some automation is a great way of making sure that your business can still work when you have those really crappy weeks. So um, it'll walk you through kind of the things you might want to automate in your web design business, how you can use them, all the tools you need, all that kind of stuff. So charlotteisaac.com slash Josh Hall is where you can find that. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. We'll have that linked in the show notes. Of course. Um, final question for you is personal. When you went through that season of your life where it was just, it was all, you know, rain and pouring. Um, is there one thing that you wish you would have done differently or had been prepared for it is it could, it could be something small. It could be larger. What would be one thing you wish you would have, you know, done differently or had in place during that season? I wish I gave myself even more time than I do. Uh, so something I've learned from it is when I take a vacation now, I take a week off before and after as well from all client responsibilities um, so that I've kind of got that reactionary time. I don't know if you ever come home from a vacation, you've got like 10,000 emails and some of them are jumping up and down at you and all that kind of stuff. So adding buffer time is probably what I've learned. And I, I had always added buffer time. Now I've extended it out. I just the more space you give yourself, like nothing goes wrong. Awesome. You've got a clear week to work on your business and catch up and, and do whatever you do, but great space. point. <laughs> Such a great point. If you're new into freelance or entrepreneurship or web design, you will learn a week of vacation means three weeks that are screwed up because you have the week before that you're getting all your projects out. You're going to be hustling. And then the week on vacation that hopefully you can completely detach. And then the week after, which is a nightmare for all freelancers, unless you have a team that's handling stuff because suddenly your workload is like tripled. Uh, well said, very well said. So balance that again, it kind of goes back to like the, ex the expecting of like what's ahead when you know, there's going to be some problems. That was definitely what I found is vacation means three weeks that are going to be very, very messed up and different. And moving house and all the other things that we need to take time off. So maybe the summary is expect the unexpected. Expect the unexpected. Yep. Gosh, that's great. Do you, uh, do you know, have you connected with Emma Kate or, or I her, haven't uh, actually, I have uh, seen her on your show, but I haven't actually connected with her. I probably should. Yeah. You, you, you made me think of her when you talked about the boundaries episode. Cause that's what we talked about. I think, Oh, I feel terrible. Is Emma in Sydney or Melbourne? She's somewhere, she's somewhere down under there. I feel terrible. I can't remember exactly where she's at, but yeah, I'll, I might need to connect you guys. You guys would hit it off. Um, uh, especially with your, you know, your, 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 mindset and approach to business and balance and everything else. Yeah. I'll have to connect you guys. Cause I'd love um, that. Yeah. It's always nice uh, meeting like-minded people and like having these kind of conversations. I think yeah, yeah it's so much fun. So I really and appreciate it. Thanks. Josh. You don't have to do a call at six 30 in the morning. So I just want to say again, thank you for that because I ain't doing a call on six 30 in the morning. It would not be, it would not go well. So I'm super impressed that you were able to kick it in the gear so early. Caffeine is the secret. That's the secret. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. So thanks so much for coming on and for sharing a lot of awesome tips about this. This was super fun and I'm excited to, uh, to stay in touch and, and definitely we'll send everybody over to, to Charlotte Isaac.com slash Josh Hall for your resource there for the mini course. And yeah, definitely excited to, to keep on, uh, going and seeing what you do here moving forward. Yeah. Thank you. Me too. Hey guys and gals just wanted to pop in with a couple things before you head out. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast. I would love to hear your feedback and it will also help other web designers find the show. Be sure to check out the show notes for this episode. Just go to joshhall.co, click on podcasts and search this episode number and you'll find all the links, descriptions and resources we talked about. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and you'll be notified when the next episode is live. Thanks again for tuning in and I'll catch you guys on the next episode.